Okay, welcome everybody. Um, welcome to uh, our July edition of Deep Dive with DUI. Um, we are streaming this live on, on Facebook at this time also, um, if you're not with us on Zoom. Um, if you are watching us on Zoom, it's best to be watching this in the speaker view. Um, please uh, use the chat window um, to on either Facebook or Zoom and post any questions that you have um, throughout the presentation. Um, we will answer those. We'll have like an open question and answer um, session at the end of this, um, and we can go through some of those. Um, so with that, um, I'd like to introduce today's speakers. We actually have two today. Um, so it's a little different uh, format than, than what I've been doing. So I'm going to um, ask to add them to the spotlight. Just give me a second. More than one to go at a time. So here we are. Um, so first I'd like to introduce um, Jim Ritterhoff. Um, he's going to be our, our main pre presenter today. Um, that's going to go over uh, the 100 Yards of Hope project. Um, he is the executive director and co-founder of Forest Blue. Uh, he's been a and working, and still working as a professional writer for the past 25 years. Um, and this is interesting. I always find it interesting when people are um, creative people. Um, Jim's penned and directed award-winning advertising campaign, campaigns, screenplays, teleplays, and documentaries. Um, and he's the co-founder and director, uh, creative director of an advertising um, firm called Chowder Inc. or Incorporated. So with that, <laughs> he wrote a, a movie and produced a movie. Um, that's awesome. Um, I looked at the trailer. Um, of course, it has to do with some scuba diving in there um, and, and obviously something to help save or have an environmental message. And a children's book that uh, looks pretty cool. Um, I'm just going to quickly share a photo of that. Um, I'm going to switch over here. And just so everyone can see this, it's, I think it's kind of cool. Um, I got it somewhere. <laughs> so there we go. Um, he wrote a book called Took the Specialist Turtle, um, which is awesome. Um, considering we did have the World Turtle Day not too long ago. Um, but that's a interesting, looks like an interesting story with some good photos. Um, anyways. <laughs> yeah. I thought it was interesting. <laughs> um, my daughter may be too old for that now, but she may still appreciate the art um, part of the story. So Jim's an avid scuba diver and lifelong environmentalist. Um, he's previously served as the board of directors as, um, of the Central Caribbean Marine Institute. That's a mouthful. Um, was recently, recently named the 2019 Sea Hero of the Year. Um, by Scuba Diving Magazine and the Seiko Watch Corporation for his work with Forest Blue. And our co-presenter today um, is a retired um, SEAL, Master Chief. Um, he is also the co-founder of Forest Blue. Um, and his name is Gonzo. I just don't want to like mess that up. So, um, and apparently the East Coast Gonzo. Yes, sir. Yes, <laughs> so that's, this is awesome. So welcome both of you guys. Um, so I am honored to have you guys here. I mean, anyone that first of all has served in the military, um, I appreciate everything you guys have done. And of course now with all the work for saving the environment, for keeping places for myself, my kids, maybe you know whoever in the future um, that we have a, a great place to enjoy the oceans. So, so with that, Jim, I'm gonna pass this over to you. And this, is, this is now your show for however you want to go. All right. Well, thanks, Jack. Um, very appreciative of this opportunity. And thank everybody at DUI and everybody who's attending. Uh, we love the opportunity to talk about Force Blue. It's important, you know, that we get the message out. And today to share with you a little bit about our, our 100 Yards of Hope project that we just wrapped up. So the way this is going to run, so everybody understands, is we're going to uh, do a very short presentation that's going to include a couple of videos going to start with some background about Forest Blue so that you understand our organization. And then we're going to jump into talking about, as I said, uh, 100 Yards of Hope, which was a two-year-long coral reef restoration project 
that we did in association with the NFL, um, some very big brands uh, that, that are NFL sponsors uh, down in Florida between the two Super Bowls, um, Super Bowl 54 in Miami and Super Bowl 55 in Tampa. And then when we wrap up, I'm gonna turn it over to Gonzo toward the end of the presentation, just to talk to you a little bit about what it means from a veteran's perspective to be involved with Force Blue. So if you have questions, as Jack said, please, you can put them in chat. Um, we're gonna try to wrap up our presentation within 30 minutes so that we'll have a full 30 minutes to just do what we do best, which is talk and, and share, share our thoughts with you guys in a more informal way. So with that, that I, I, I oh, no, no, no. Oh. Um, I, I want to interrupt you here for real quickly because yeah. um, I, I do want to ask the question yeah. um, before you get started with this presentation. Yeah. Um, so Gonzo, just be warned that I'm going to ask you the same thing before you start talking. Uh, yes, sir. So we love scuba diving. We love okay. the ocean. So what is it that got you so passionate about scuba diving or what is it that just you know, makes you want to get in the water and dive and, or who got you going with this? I mean, what, what is it that, you know, how did you get here? Well, I mean, I'll go first. I mean, Gonza's probably <laughs> has to do with very cold water. Actually mine does too, but uh, in a, a semi, a little bit more hostile probably setting than mine. But uh, I started diving, it's hard to believe now, but I started diving in 1986. Uh, I was a graduate student in journalism up at Syracuse University in New York, very cold place. And there's not a lot to do up there in the winter. So um, my girlfriend at the time, now my wife, whose father was a British sub aqua scuba instructor, cajoled me into going to take scuba classes in Syracuse, New York. Well, I, I walked into a dive shop on Erie Boulevard in Syracuse, if anybody's ever been to Syracuse, kind of a main drag. And uh, a guy named Jer Hollenbeck, who's actually pretty well known in the dive industry, as it turns out, he was on the Atosha and um, was, N I guess it was NASDS back then, was the certifying agency. I walked into his dive shop and the first thing I saw was a ceiling to floor giant poster of him mixing martinis at depth. He had a special contraction he had put together. And I said, that's the sport for me. So that was my introduction. That's how I, and you know, two weeks later I, I had all the gear and was in training. So that's my story. <laughs> Gonzo? It's, you never know. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, you know, as a SEAL, you know, you go through buds uh, right there in Coronado, nice, nice warm weather, uh, nice warm water, not. Uh, but you, you know, you start off open circuit in the pool and then you do closed circuit, you know, with the, with the Drager, uh, diving in the Coronado Bay. And then I was, I was East coast as you, as you had mentioned. Uh, so then you do, we do over here from Virginia beach, uh, Puerto Rico, the Caribbean into Europe and other places. Uh, so the majority of my diving until I became a member of force blue was military diving, driving on a, diving on a Drager, uh, you know, flying at about 20, 20 feet. Um, literally just looking down at my attack board, you know, with my compass, my depth gauge and my watch and just doing my legs, you know, hitting the target and then extracting. So uh, four hour dives sound pretty cool until you're on a four hour dive. Uh, so especially in, in cold water. So, uh, but then, uh, you know, I, I, uh, I came on board with Force Blue for the 100 Yards of Hope project. And the very first time that uh, I dove uh, open circuit for recreation was on that initial dive that I had, that I did with Force Blue, wow. so that was pretty transcending to go from this to taking it all in, uh, and and really um, kind of shifting. And I don't want to like PTSD is too strong of a word, but just the the shifting of the mindset of military combat diving to all right, let me let me enjoy, let me take it all in, let me just really appreciate the marine environment. And as Jim said, you know, when he was hooked, that was it for me. I knew I was force blue all the way after that. And I've thoroughly enjoyed the projects that we've done so far. And, uh, and it's also enjoyable for me at doing such a long time in the military to see other veterans enjoy it as well. And you see that, that aha moment when they, 
when they dive in there and they're like, oh man, this is just amazing. So that's what's enjoyable for me as well. Ah, that's that's cool. I would have thought that you would, would have, during that time, gone, gone and done some sort of fun dive <laughs> at some point in time. You know, we were just so busy. I was pre-9-11, so I was in the SEAL teams before 9-11. And then once 9-11 hit, we were just, we were so busy, so busy that uh, I, you were just either deployed or preparing to deploy. So uh, just a little too busy. But now that I'm retired, I'm able to enjoy it and, and truly enjoy it. So, Well, welcome to the the fun side of scuba diving. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. And Thank actually you. being able to see things that are out and about and the colors. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. Yep. Okay. So, so, so thanks for sharing guys. I mean, that's, that's great. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I love hearing these stories. It makes it, you know, we know who you are, you know, where you come from. It, this is great. So, so Jim, uh, right. back to you. All right. So I'm going to share my screen here with everyone and hope, hopefully everybody can see this. If you can't, please let me know. Um, okay. So I'm going to start. This is a presentation. I have to explain this a little bit. This is a presentation we gave about a month after the Super Bowl to NOAA. Um, to a large group from the Coral Conservation Program at NOAA. So I figured we needed a title that, you know, was really complicated and scientific sounding. <laughs> so uh, the ostensive, ostensibly the name of this presentation is Creation, Collaboration and Communication Redefined for a Hyper-Partisan Political World. But the real name of the presentation, and it's it's co not coincidental that it's the same name of all our presentations that we give at Force Blue, is one team, one fight. And, and that's more than just a slogan for us. It's really a mantra. And, and hopefully you'll, you'll come to understand why as we go through the presentation. But um, so to start with a little background, because people are probably asking, well, what is Force Blue exactly? Did you want to make that full screen since you're not doing the sharing the portion? Oh, sure. Sorry. I thought. Yeah. Of no, you uh, have to do the share portion if you want. You can just hit the. Uh, I'll just hit full screen. Okay. There you go. I can, I can, I can come out when I need to for, um, okay. for the videos. So uh, what is Force Blue? Well, the, the elevator pitch is, is pretty simple. We are the only 501c3 nonprofit organization in the world that retrains and redeploys former special operations veterans like Gonzo and military trained combat divers to work along scientists and environmentalists on marine conservation missions. We are not, um, we are not any branch uh, specific. We have veterans who represent uh, the Navy like Gonzo, Navy SEALs. We have recon Marines, we have Air Force Power Rescuemen uh, uh, Army uh, Special Forces. We even have a British Royal Marine and a British uh, Special Boat Service uh, veteran as part of our team. But really to tell you about what Force Blue truly is, I'd, I'd much prefer to just show you a real quick three minute video that we created that is actually in the words of some of our veterans themselves. So uh, if you bear with me for one second, I will show you that. Oop, if I can get it. Established in 2016, Force Blue is giving military veterans a new mission and a new fight. Here is that fight in their words. I did my duty and I did what I did for the United States Marine Corps to be no better friend, no worse enemy, and to fight for those who can't fight for themselves. I lost some of my brothers doing this. I want to come home, become part of a solution of humanity, not a seat of destruction. His extraordinary efforts under direct, immediate danger to his own life resulted in saving four American lives, one host nation civilian, and returning four soldiers killed in action to their families. To have men die in your arms, it's a very horrible thing to attempt to shoulder that responsibility and fail then. You can't help but implicate yourself in that death. When you see their wives and you see their kids, what do you say? The only thing you can say is at least they were doing what they wanted to do 
for something that they believed in and loved when they got killed. They believed in something bigger, better, and wanted to make a change. Post-traumatic stress is viewed as some sort of a mental illness, a breaking of the mental processes of the spirit. And really it isn't, you know, these, these are still the same guys. They're just carrying some pretty awful things which haven't been processed. Anybody experiences the horrors of combat, I think it forces them at some point to change. We're so strong and we're so resilient, but we're the last to ask for help. We take it out on the people that we love. And that's, it's just a horrible thing. We have to gain perspective to heal ourselves from that. I mean, we are a mess in the way of how many insults we have of traumas. We've just become cynical to it. It's like, what do I do now? What do you do as a used up hero? By retraining and redeploying these warriors on missions to preserve and restore our environment, Force Blue is repurposing their skills for the good of the planet and the betterment of themselves. They want a mission. They want to move forward with something and be able to find a new way of channeling all that hardship into something that can benefit them. I just can't imagine the sacrifice that these guys have had to go through repeatedly and then to be humbled by the fact that they were so excited to learn about the ocean and how to preserve it and how they could be a part of it given what they've gone through. The reason you can get past all of the crazy things that happen isn't because you're this super battle-hardened ninja. It's because you have a team there and you're pushing forward because that's what you do. Just driving towards one thing, which is mission, you can get past everything until you don't have a mission. They were amazing. It was so awesome to work with people that clearly have insane experience underwater, know what they're doing, are driven by purpose. To be in meaningful groups where I can provide community, develop that sense of continued growth and development beyond our experiences, that has tremendous value. I got special people in my life that believe in me, and I am believing in myself. It really is one team, one fight. We're fighting for something innocent and something that needs protection, and that's the ocean. I'm not done serving. I don't know if there's such a thing. Okay, so again, uh, Force Blue in the words of our veterans. Uh, since we began in 2016, you know, we've deployed over a dozen times on everything from, um, you know, hurricane uh, intervention work uh, in, in Puerto Rico and Florida to green sea turtle rescue and survey. But with the one project that we're going to share with you today, um, as I mentioned up front, oop, hang on one second. Oh, sorry. Um, it's a project called 100 Yards of Hope which was a two year coral reef restoration effort. Um, what it was, going back to that idea of creation, uh, collaboration and communication, uh, 100 Yards of Hope, well it is, because it's a, a growing entity, a large, score, a large scale coral reef restoration project located uh, just offshore in Key Biscayne. It's in very shallow water. Uh, 17 to 18 feet and is a site that even the divers and even snorkelers can visit. Uh, it began in 2019, really as a photo op. Uh, the NFL uh, came to us and the Miami Super Bowl host committee and said, it's the NFL's 100th season, the Super Bowl's in Miami. So we'd like to do something symbolic to give back to uh, the environment. Uh, so they tasked us with planning 100 pieces of coral in honor of the 100th uh, anniversary and Super Bowl 54, which we did. Uh, then that year at the Super Bowl, we actually went back to the NFL and said that was great, but we could do something much bigger and more significant. So we expanded the project uh, to 100 yards of hope, which is an entire football field size restoration, really an ecosystem level restoration project. Uh, the NFL agreed, and it, because there was a very unique situation where the Super Bowl was moving from, uh, Tam from Miami to Tampa, very seldom is there two Super Bowls in the same state back-to-back -back years, but there was. Um, they saw this as the connective tissue between the two cities and the two Super Bowls, 
Um, in fact, uh, it was just kind of coincidence that about 90% of the coral that we were out planting over in Miami was actually coming from the Florida Aquarium, which is in Tampa. So it was this very natural link between the two Super Bowls. Uh, the site currently, and it's doing very well, we, we monitor it just about every month, now consists of over uh, 1,250 branching and boulder corals, thousands, tens of thousands actually, of coral larvae, and uh, hundreds of diadema that were just put down actually in April. And the, the biggest news and success of this to date is that the site actually spawned um, last fall and we expected to do so again. So I think we have something like a 95% survivor rate to this to date, which is very extraordinary. And really it just means we picked the right spot and, uh, and the corals that we used are, um, are thriving. Uh, collaboration, I think this is the real kind of untold story of Force Blue. It's, it's um, what we like to say, uh, you know, is kind of our convening power, the, the partners we were able to be, uh, bring together. Back in 2019, when it was just, let's put down 100 pieces of coral, we had some pretty high powered scientific partners. We had the University of Miami's Rosensteel School, their rescue reef program the Florida Department of Environmental Protection and the Philip and Patricia Frost Museum of Science in Miami all helped in that initial outplanning. But by the project's end, uh, the, the enormity of the job and also of the, uh, the awareness we were raising, we were able to enlist, to include to that list, uh, Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission, the Florida Aquarium, and Secor International. From a private public sector partner standpoint, and this is, is really important because you know, we're talking about organizations that had never been involved in any kind of marine conservation before. But again, we started in 2019 with NFL Green, which is the NFL sustainability arm and the Miami Super Bowl host committee. And then we had a company like Verizon who uh, helped fund the initial out planning. First time they'd ever done anything in the realm of, of coral reef conservation, uh, Patty, and, and a, another nonprofit organization called greatergood.org. By project's end, we had added, of course, the Tampa Super Bowl host committee. We received a substantial grant from the NOAA Coral Reef Conservation Program to actually make a documentary about the project, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, now he jumped on board. And then we had companies like Pepsi, Castrol, Oikos, Yogurts, Innovation Brands, which is a big wine importer, uh, and Step Change Clothing, which actually makes our, uh, our uh, uh, sun shirts, our, um, uh, you know, stuff, I'm sorry, yeah, rash guards, that's the word I was looking for, uh, out of recycled bottles um, came on board. So you're seeing a lot of different types of organizations getting involved in this big effort, which really was the, the whole point. Communications, because it doesn't matter, as I was saying to Jack earlier, you know, our story is great and it's compelling, but it doesn't matter if people don't hear it. So we do, and it's why we, we spend so much time documenting everything we do. Uh, to date, 100 Yards of Hope has generated over 100 local and national news stories including a four minute feature on NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt that actually aired the Saturday before Super Bowl 55. Uh, this is kind of a, a statistic we're very proud of. It comes from sort of the marketing world, but it's important to our, our, you know, our private sector partners is in, in, in basically a two week period alone, we, we garnered almost $4 million in earned media. Uh, just during NFL Green Week and Super Bowl Week, that two-week period prior to the Super Bowl, uh, which is pretty extraordinary for a, a very small investment um, of, of um, you know, their, their marketing budgets. Um, and enough content, again, I referenced this earlier, to build a 45-minute documentary that actually premiered at the NFL draft in Cleveland in April. So you had the story of a coral reef in Florida being shown to, I think, and I, I think COVID notwithstanding, there were something like, you know, 100,000 people went through Cleveland during the NFL draft who were all exposed to 
uh, the documentary. So what are the key takeaways? What has this project taught us? Well, it's that, you know, we like to say opposites attract. I mean, one of the, the other mantras of Forest Blue is that we don't care if you get on board up from the right side or the left side, you know, we're all in the same boat in this fight to save our marine environment, right? So we have scientists from a very different background than seals like Gonzo who partner and, and really become even more than, than just, you know, business partners. It's become very much of a family in, in the way we approach these projects. So people who you might think have nothing in common have, have found a commonality around, around the work that we do. I mentioned our convening power earlier, but it's really this idea of service, of continued service, not just for our veterans who Force, Bill, Force Blue was built to sort of help in their transition back to civilian life by giving them that sense of mission, of purpose, and of, of something greater than themselves, but to the scientists and, and to the corporate sponsors and the, the government officials who are involved with us, there's something very attractive about this idea of service. And there's also part and parcel with that, I think, a longing for belonging. People right now are desperate for something positive to belong to. We've all seen kind of the horrific effects of negative belonging. You know, when you look at, you know, what happened in our capital in, on January 6th, or, you know, you know, we're not a political organization in any way, shape or form, but we do want to provide a sense of belonging where people can come around and find commonality in this fight to save something that really isn't political which is our, our oceans and our, our marine habitats. And lastly, and this is something, it, it, it didn't come just from this project, but it's something that our four years of operation have sort of instilled in, I think, our, in me, certainly, and in our organization. And it's something I actually gave a presentation on at DEMA two years ago. It's this idea that, that in some sense, recreational diving is over, right? If you have the ability to enjoy the underwater world as, as I, I imagine you all do, or you wouldn't be on this call. If you have the ability, the training, the love of the underwater world, then you have the responsibility to protect it and to get involved in this fight. Um, the days of just kind of diving and having a good time and look around, yeah, that's great, but there's work to be done and we need all hands on deck. And the last thing that I included in here before I turn it over to, to Gans is um, I, this actually just came across my email earlier in the week. It's, it's a, a link to nine organizations that are focused on coral reef restoration around the world. So if you're asking, well, how can I get involved in helping to restore a reef? This is a great start. You know, all of these organizations will take experienced divers. You don't have to be a veteran. You don't have to be, a, a, you know, crazy scientists, you know, coral scientists to do it, they'll take you and they'll get you involved in restoring reefs. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Master Chief Steve Gonzalez to just give you a little bit of a veteran's perspective on why this, this is so important. Thanks, Jim. So, yep. Yeah, so please feel free to call me Gonzo. Like I said, uh, my name is Steve Gonzalez. I uh, did 34 years total. Uh, 30 active. I did four years in the reserves. Uh, over 20 of that was as a SEAL. I served time in the regular military. When I first went in in 1982, there were no books, no movies, uh, you know, nothing about SEALs. So I didn't know what anything about it. And then some guys came on my ship. Uh, they didn't look like us. They didn't act like us. They sure didn't dress like us. And I said, who are those guys? And they said, well, those are SEALs. And I was like, what the heck's a SEAL? So I went and talked with him. And I knew instantly that that's the job for me. So um, I was a little bit older when I went through. I was, uh, I was in my th uh, early 30s when I went through BUDS, which is uh, I had to get a waiver, an age waiver, actually, and um, made it through and then uh, went out, served on the East Coast uh, the rest of my career. Uh, multiple, multiple deployments to Afghanistan, Iraq, um, Africa, Central South America, you name it. So... Uh, as I'm getting ready to retire, I say, okay, what am I gonna do now? Uh, and along comes Force Blue. I, I knew that I didn't wanna go down the usual path of, uh, of uh, contracting or continuing to 
to stay in the special operations field. Uh, so I was kind of looking for a new purpose. That's what Force Blue allows me to do. Uh, I say this quite often that I have a 17 year old daughter. She knows very little of what I did in the military by design because of the nature of my, my job. So my legacy within the SEAL teams, she knows a little bit about, but now she sees my legacy about caring for our planet. And I hope that with her generation, they can see it and they can say, you know what, this is something that I wanna be a part of. So uh, that's my legacy there, I, I think, is, is showing her and her generation that, hey, we only have one planet, so we better take care of it. And Force Blue allows me to do that. So for, like I mentioned in the beginning, this was transcending. This is the first time I'd ever dove in, and, and witnessed the marine environment as, as truly breathtaking as it is. Um, as we would outplant this coral, you'd go to get another piece of coral. And by the time you went back to plant that one, marine life was there. Fish were coming in and, and literally starting to, knit, starting to pick on the, on the piece that you just planted. So that was, it's pretty neat. You know, it, it's really neat. And then of course, as you're swimming to and from the uh, dive site, seeing, seeing everything that's there, uh, everything from small fish to uh, small sharks, uh, you name it. So it was, it was quite wonderful, quite enjoying. So uh, for the veteran perspective, I, I would venture to say that most veterans are called to serve our country because we want to serve our country. Force Blue allows us to continue to serve our country just in a different manner, but, but just as important. So that's what it, uh, with being, Force, uh, being a member of Force Blue and, and being involved with 100 Yards of Hope uh, and then and our next projects, that's what it means to me. So uh, as I like to say, with that, I'll shut my cake hole and I'll answer <laughs> any questions that somebody might have. All right, thanks, Guns. I just have, uh, everybody can still see that. Um, I just have, let me go back to my full screen mode, just real quick. Oh, we actually have one more I have to get out of this. I have one more, you know, we, I, I talked a little bit earlier about the NOAA grant that we got to tell the story of 100 Yards of Hope. And I'm going to share with you all a link where you can actually go see the film now for a very limited time. It's 45 minutes long. It's actually available on uh, Florida's Coral Reef website. But I want to play for you now uh, a trailer that hopefully inspires you to want to go see the film and um, explains what, you know, what, what's at stake with, with projects like 100 Yards of Hope. So I'm just going to play that real quick. All right. Our Florida's coral reef has seen dramatic declines to the point that our reefs are on the precipice of disappearing. If you live in Nebraska, the middle of the country, how is coral reefs important to you? We get that question all the time. Coral reefs are the breeding ground of a variety of species that live in the ocean. And if we don't protect the ocean, we won't have a world where we can breathe healthy air. There's a lot of bad news when we talk about coral reefs, but there's also a lot of hope innovations and new tools and new ideas shine some light on the potential for us to restore these delicate reef systems. We were really the first people to be able to predictably spawn corals in a biosecure facility and we can do it in a way where they can be planted back out onto the reefs again. So how do we make restoration and outplanting really efficient? Force Blue retrains and then redeploys former special operations veterans, all military trained combat divers, to work alongside environmentalists and marine scientists on ocean conservation missions. It's a challenge for many veterans to go from that really defined sense of mission and then trying to figure out who you are and what you're supposed to do as a civilian. I fell apart after the Iraq war. That darkness, that shadow, it started tearing me apart. The waters of life from Force Blue completely healed that. The bulk of their underwater work had been in the dark, in kind of murky areas. They never looked around, and now they're getting back in the water, amazed at the biodiversity and how therapeutic it is to have a different mission. Innovation happens when challenges present themselves. Big solutions require collaborative conservation. Everybody is coming together for 100 Yards of Hope. By connecting this coral reef project to Super Bowl, 
We hope it will bring much wider attention to the plight of coral and to our oceans. 70% of people pay attention to sports, sports news, sports headlines. Only 15% of people pay attention to science. We're at the restoration site, so we've arranged the plot to look like a football field. So each buddy group is actually going to take one of the yard lines to build the perimeter of the field. Most of the things that I've done have been more on the demolition side. So this is pretty neat in the restoration side. People that have experienced trauma and pain want to protect things that cannot protect themselves. We have to heal others or other things to heal ourselves. While our time is dwindling, the fight's not over. Right now we have the world's attention. All eyes are on Florida. This really is ground zero. If there's anywhere to fight for their future, it's here. Okay. So you said there's a, a full version that people can watch for that? Yeah, there is. And I'm going to share that if I can real quick. Uh, let me go back to the the screen mode. So if every, anybody wants to go see that film in its entirety, again, it's about 45 minutes long. It's really worth it. It's, a, it's I, you know, I'm a little biased, but I think it's a pretty compelling uh, uh, piece of content. It's at uh, floridascoralreef.org slash 100 yards of hope. So you can go there and see it, like I said, for a limited time. I think it'll probably be up for most of the summer, but um, we, we do pull it down when we have, uh, when we have, some, we have some other public screenings that are they're gonna, in-person screenings that we're gonna be uh, hosting. And then also, you know, obviously, uh, if you wanna learn more about Force Blue, and we encourage everyone to, uh, please visit our website. Uh, it's just www.forcebluteam dot org and with that you have uh gonzo and my sincere thanks and we'll take any uh we'll take any questions anyone <laughs> I believe you're muted, Jack. Yeah. Way to go. Okay, now. <laughs> my mean. Good yeah. at it. It's nice of Marcel Marcelo to join us today. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so I forget. Sometimes I use the microphone mic, um, mute and not the Zoom one that warns you that I'm muted. Um, anyways, so the question... <laughs> It's kind of like a two-part question that was posted. Um, one was, I'm going to kind of go backwards on how I said this. So for all of you who could lip read what I was saying before, um, the first question kind of backwards from what I said before was, are you going to go back and do like a reassessment of, of like you said, the 95% were still viable and stuff like that? Do you have plans in going back? with the scientific community to monitor that and see what the success rate is. And, and then are you gonna have that as a, you know, make it bigger, better, whatever in the future? And then the other part of that question was, do you have any other projects that you are, you know, going to expand on? Maybe not with that one, but in other areas um, with different organizations, different scientists, whatever. So yeah, that's the so first question. Okay, so yeah, so the answer is yes, we do plan to go back to the 100 Yards of Hope site quite a lot, um, you know, throughout the remainder of this year and next year. Uh, the good news is our, our scientific partners who were really the scientific leads, and, and that, that's a point we should make is that we're not scientists. So every operation that we go on, every deployment, we partner with the subject matter experts and, you know, the best scientists we can get a hold of to go do that particular uh, operation. In this case, it was the folks from the University of Miami. And this is literally in their backyard. So 
they're out there uh, monitoring, I think almost every month, the site. Our hope with some of our vets is to get back in. We're gonna be doing, um, we're doing a, a series of summer uh, coastal operations with Pepsi around the state of Florida uh, this summer. We're gonna be back in the Miami, Fort Lauderdale area in August. And there's, there's plans for hopefully to get some of our team back on the site as well. But the monitoring continues. Do we want to expand it? Hell yeah. You know, we, we had a, a screening of the film actually about two weeks ago, three weeks ago now in Miami. And, uh, you know, I said to everybody who came out for it that, you know, why stop at 100 yards? You know, let's do 200 yards. Let's do 100 miles. You know, it's all, obviously, it comes down to funding. It comes down to, uh, you know, political willpower. But yeah, um, we would love to expand this project. I think the great thing about this project, and I alluded to it when we talked about those partnerships, is that we set a model for companies that have never been involved in funding marine conservation projects to get, in, to get involved. And now, as we look toward the future and other restoration work, not just in Florida, but around, around the world, honestly, hopefully we've raised some interest in some places where there hadn't been before and being a part of that. Um, in terms of other operations that we're gonna go on, we are getting ready in about 10 days now to deploy down to the Florida Keys for two weeks on a green sea turtle uh, rescue and uh, survey operation. There's a, uh, a disease called fibropapillomatosis. Took me about two years to be able to pronounce that. That uh, is a real problem in, in the turtle population around the world, but it's particularly bad in Florida. Uh, it causes the turtles to get these massive tumors that occlude their eyes. They can't you know, they can't see to, eat, to hunt or to eat, and they can't, uh, they can't avo avoid boats. So it's a real, real problem. We're going to be doing that with um, folks from Inwater Research, Loggerhead Marine Life, uh, and um, Florida Atlantic University. We're in discussions to hopefully, possibly in September, August, be, I'm in Charleston, South Carolina, to be operating here and in Georgia on some dolphin um, survey work, which would be outstanding. And then as I told you, Jack, the NFL's approached us uh, with some of their sponsors about Super Bowl in Los Angeles this year and possibly getting out to you all out there to do at the very least a, um, a harbor cleanup. You know, it, it happens to be the 50th anniversary this year of the uh, NOAA's National Marine uh, sanctuary system. There are, I think the 15th just came online, but I think there are 15 national marine sanctuaries around the U.S. that people don't even know about, right? I think four of them are in California and, and one of them is the Channel Islands, right? So a real problem out there is that there's kelp, invasive kelp that goes out to the, uh, you know, gets dragged out by boats to the, uh, the Channel Islands, to the marine sanctuary, and it, it, it just doesn't belong there. So that's one of the things we're looking at with the Ocean Conservancy. And again, with the NFL is maybe having a one day event where we get a lot of volunteer divers to come out and help us clean up a harbor. Right. Uh, you know, so we joke, you know, because, you know, ask me tomorrow and I'll tell you three other things. I mean, the good news is that our message is resonating. I think our story is attractive, uh, not just to the scientific community, but to um, potential sponsors and, and corporations who want to, you know, give back not only to our veteran community, but to make a difference. So we're optimistic and we've got last thing and then I'll shut my cake hole on this question is that we've got um, a plan in place to create a series of force blue outposts through dive shops around the country whereby veterans and, and also down the road civilians will be able to come in and take a specialty course. And, you know, we just got our AAUS accreditation. So we'll be able to offer a course whereby people can become force blue assistant scientific divers and join us when we deploy. So that'll, you know, we're still a small four-year-old organization, but our plans are really to, you know, expand this thing uh, globally. 
I mean, that's, I, that's what I, 10 years from now, I'd like to see a force blue Australia, a force blue South Africa, you know, because the, the vets are out there. Gons will tell you, we've had, we've had special operations veterans who fit our criterion currently um, reach out from Brazil, Israel, Germany, uh, Australia, South Africa, Israel. I mean, you know, there's no shortage of, of talent that wants to get involved in the fight. Yeah. So it, it's, uh, it's one of those things where all of us as divers, we, we benefit from the oceans and, and conserving them. And so many years of, you know, all this different kinds of harmful fishing, um, just yeah. pollutions and all that stuff, you know, it, it's taken away from something that all of us, you know, really enjoy and want to enjoy in the future. I mean, I, I know there's a lot of people just in general travel to Florida just to go diving because one warm water diving, you have the coral reefs, you know, if they're gone, that kind of impacts, you know, that the tourism and the diving industry there. Um, just a little quick intro onto how I found Forest Blue is um, I was the account manager for Florida for DUI. Um, one of my dive shops, um, which was closed during the COVID times or kind of closed, um, did this thing called thrash till you splash <laughs> campaign. And I was like, Oh, I'm on that. <laughs> I can do these challenges. Um, so I got involved by doing that and, and putting together the videos and putting some sponsorship money of my own, um, into this, um, and having fun with it. I mean, it was, um, and then, yeah, some of those challenges, I was like, yeah, <laughs> there's no way I'm doing that one with the, but I'll, I'll, I'll make it, I'll put up a good show. Anyways, <laughs> so uh, that's how I, I found it. You know, it's, there's a lot of different ways. I, I assume that we can um, help contribute or participate in this. I mean, that's, that's one way that I found. Yep. No, I mean, we always, you know, obviously we always, we're, we're uh, not, we're a 501c3, so we're always looking for, you know, donations, any donation anyone can make. I mean, the good news is it goes directly because we are small. There's very little overhead. It goes directly to, uh, to get guys like Gonzo out and in the water. But just beyond that, you know, just help us share the, you know, spread the word, right? Because it's like I've said, it's, it's so important that we don't, you know, one of our guys, uh, Roger Sparks, who, who's a highly decorated Air Force Power Rescue, and you saw in a couple of those videos, said, uh, you know, 10 guys in Speedos. And yeah, our guys, a couple of these guys wear Speedos all the time, right? It's, 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 it's eye-opening. Um, but his point was 10 guys in, in Speedos can't change the world. You know, we're up to 20 now, but 20 guys in Speedos can't change the world but they can get enough people inspired that can change the world. Right. And that's, but the only way that happens is, is if people hear our story and, and people want to get involved with us. So that's, if you're asking how people can help. That's, that's what they can do. Awesome. So a question was um, when you're planting this coral, since the depths are, are relatively shallow, mm -hmm. um, one of the, I guess the technical question, why scuba and why not some sort of surface applied, um, surface supply air source. Yeah, Gon, do you wanna, do you wanna tackle yeah. that? Uh, for instance, like the, you know, the hundred yards of hope we were scattered about, you know, so you have the, you have the surface, uh, surface supplied, uh, you have all of that going on, all the, you know, the, I'll say complications, but it is, it is you add a lot more to it. Whereas if you just scuba, uh, it's, it, you're doing about an hour at a time anyway. So you can, you know, you, cause you're, you're transferring all the equipment and everything. And we work with all the local dive shops. So it's not like we're going to come in to say that if we're going to go to San Diego, uh, I'll pick up Coronado just cause that's, you know, my, my, my stomping grounds there when I started, uh, we're going to do a dive in Coronado. What we don't want to do is show up in the corner and I'll say, Hey, we're here and we're going to save the day. Now we engage with the local dive shops. A lot of times the, the air, some of the supplies is donated by those, by those dive shops. So we appreciate that. So that's what we've kind of relied on is, is the scuba is, is on the tanks and things of that, that nature. Uh, and quite frankly, we just don't have the manpower or the uh, capital to have surface supply. Uh, you know, we, our boats are chartered or donated. We have fish and wildlife, uh, FWC, they support us. So uh, since we are smaller, we just don't have that, 
that uh, capability just yet. Um, and quite frankly, uh, I think a lot of people just enjoy scuba. You know, I mean, uh, that's like I said, that's the first time I've done it since in the nineties when I went to Bud's, mm -hmm. you know, I had never dove open circuit uh, other than like a recoil dive, which is like swimming a pool two times, you know, I mean, it's just, you know, so this is, it's very enjoyable once you get used to the bubbles escaping because you're so used to diving a rebreather and you freak out if a bubble escapes. So, but yeah, so that's really what it is. It's just, uh, we just don't have the capabilities yet. And uh, a lot of guys just really enjoy it. Yeah, so there's a, a question for you, Gonzo, that since you're, you're just answering that question, but anyways, before I answer that, ask the question, it's just kind of funny. You're talking about, oh, it's weird seeing bubbles. You know, I mean, remember the first time I went and dove Florida, which was my mm -hmm. first warm water dive. And I've been diving a dry suit, you know, I'm already well into my dry suit diving night. And I went there and I didn't bring my dry suit. So I dove wet. And I remember the, the dive master on the boat, you know, they heard that this is my first warm water dive and they're all excited. And I'm like, they're going, you're going to love it. The water's so warm. And I'm like, okay. So I jump in the water and, you know, and I give my, you know, I'm okay. And they go, what do you think? How's the water? I'm like, I am wet. <laughs> I mean, what is this thing? I'm right. wet. Yeah. <laughs> it, was yeah. like, it was foreign to me. It's like, going, ah. yeah. um, but anyways, uh, the question was to you was what's since you're doing this now for fun or recreationally and not uh, on a specific like military type mission, what's the most interesting thing you've seen or have done that you weren't expecting or didn't know about in in the oceans. I mean, like something that was like surprised you that just went, wow, it's like, you know, I've been missing this part of it. <laughs> I've, that, that's quite actually quite easy. Color. I've most of my dives were at night in the middle of the night in water that you could barely see your hand in front of your face. Uh, so just taking in just the color, just the beauty and the color of the marine environment, uh, whether it's the coral reefs, uh, the, the fish, you know, all the, all the marine life around me everything, uh, really just taking that in, taking in the color, taking in everything, just the beauty. And of course, Florida, the visibility is, you know, wonderful. Whereas if you're diving Coronado or Newport, Rhode Island or Norway, this is what you see right here, you know? So uh, yeah, so just taking in the color, taking it all in. I'm, I'm sure that most of you guys have, have been diving, you know, uh, your rec dive for years, you've been able to enjoy that. So that, I have it. So that was one of the things that really uh, just, just, it still, it still like really touches me just how I felt that first dive. Hey, mm -hmm. hey, Don, you know, I was just thinking, tell the story of um, how UDT, how the UDT teams were formed and why they were formed, because I think that is such an interesting, you know, full circle. Mm -hmm. Sure. So uh, some of you might know, maybe not, but in 1943, uh, the original frogmen were, were started right in Fort Pierce, Florida, because uh, to, for amphibious landings, uh, landings in the Pacific in particular, the uh, landing craft would bottom out and they thought that they were, they were okay, they were on the shoreline. So the, the Higgins boats would drop down their front gates and the Marines would run off thinking that they were running onto the beach. Unfortunately, it was just maybe a sandbar or a coral reef. They'd take a few steps and then go down with all their gear on and, the, and they were either drowning or struggling, you know, struggling to stay alive, cutting their gear off. And then, of course, we had D-Day, June 6, 1944. So that's when they, they said, we had, the forces said we need to have something. The Brits kind of had something like it, but the uh, American forces said we need to have something. So a gentleman by the name of Draper Kaufman, uh, who is the grandfather of the SEAL team, started basic uh, training uh, for SEALs right there in Fort Pierce, Florida, to blow coral reefs, see the two, uh, get, you know, Clear, clear away or recce them, you know, go through and recce them, uh, do a reconnaissance with soundings and get see how deep it is and all the way up. Two days before D-Day, the original frogmen swam in, did the soundings all the way up to the beach, climbed up onto the beach, reccied and, you know, drew pictures on their arms and then came back and then gave those reports. And then of course D-Day uh, went on to be a success. So then you come full circle, here's this crazy old retired master chief right down the road in Miami, helping repair Florida's coral reefs. Uh, so yes, yeah, so it's basically come full circle. So um, it, it's, it, once again, it's pretty neat because I'm a, I'm a huge history buff. 
and I'm very big on our legacy. So the legacy of the SEAL teams of having to practice to remove coral reefs, coming full circle to caring for and helping repair for our coral reefs is, uh, is pretty moving and uh, something once again that, that I enjoy is being a part of that legacy. Oh, Thank you Jim, for reminding me. Yeah, that's awesome. I mean, it's amazing how, you know, nature, you know, things will, if you give it a chance and you don't keep putting it down, it will recover. So in this case, you guys are giving it a, a boost up, so to speak, and then letting it naturally hopefully take and replenish itself and, and have us humans kind of get out of the way from <laughs> keep wrecking it type of thing. Yeah, so. yeah. Um, unfortunately, when, when people ask us about, hey, what's something that, this, what's a, the greatest threat to our coral reefs, the greatest threat to our marine environment, marine environment, it's a cold splash of water that you're throwing in their face and we'll say, hey, our fellow man, you know, uh, people who just, because you'll see trash on the streets or whatever. Okay, I see it, I pick it up. But people don't think of trash under the ocean, under the water line, you know, plastic bottles, plastic, uh, plastic uh, straws, things like that, that. They'll just go, whether either by disregard or just accidentally goes over the side of a boat or through your beach yeah. party or something like that. And then it ends up uh, impacting marine, the marine life. So uh, yeah, it's, it's nice to see, a, see us uh, coming full circle. And like you said, hopefully clearing all that stuff so nature can get back to caring for herself. Yeah. So even like in San Diego, it's like every dive I go out, um, I'm always picking up some sort of piece of trash, you know, and putting it in my, my, my pocket on my dry suit, you know, just trying to clean up. It's always there. I mean, San Diego is a big tourist destination and it's, 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 it's a hard message to tell people. It's like, you know, the stuff that you're leaving on the beach, the tide changes and it will suck it back out into the ocean. You know, they just don't get that, you know, it's, you know, you know, it's interesting, Jack, too. I'll tell you, it's, it's addictive. I mean, I, I've been diving for what did I think, you know, 35 years, right? And I won't do another dive, I can't, where I don't go out and do something, whether it's a marine debris cleanup or helping with a coral restoration or, you know, anything that anybody could do, you know, any, any qualified diver could do. Because if I were to just go out and have a fun dive right now, I, I would feel... You know, from just being around this team, I'd feel like, well, that was a waste. I could have done something. And I think if, if we can get more people kind of thinking the way you just said, like every dive, there's something I can do. I can take a picture of something or I can record. I can get with an organization that's in, the, in my local area or wherever I'm traveling to. There's some kind of citizen science you can get involved in, you know? And I think once you do, then it, it really becomes, uh, it's what you want to do, you know? So I would encourage everybody to do that as well if they can. Yeah, even in San Diego, it's easy. There's, you know, you can be part of the, the reef.org, which is uh, they, they uh, do fish counts, you know, just keeping yeah. track of fish. You can take photos of the giant black sea bass. So they track where they've been. There's a lot of different things that, you know, every recreational diver can do to help out with this whole thing. Yeah. Um, so DEMA is coming up this year in, in Las Vegas. Are you guys going to be there presenting at all? I don't think we're going to be there this year. We went, uh, we went prior pre pandemic. We went for like two years. We had a booth. It's and Florida. Then, yeah. And then we went, we went, to, we want, we went to one in Vegas, the last one in Vegas, I think it had a booth, but we found that if we do go, we're just better telling our story, like walking around and not you know, not having a booth. So we may be there. I think verdict's out, but we're not going to be, um, we're not going to have a booth at, at DEMA this year. I think that was the decision that was made. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, yeah, it is a, it is one of the, the bigger shows so it does yeah. move around. And of course, coming out of this pandemic thing, you know, it's kind of put a lot of the different, you know, companies in, do we go, do we not go, you know, but the, the one thing that's that's great is that, you know, people can get out and start diving, um, not just in the United States, which we've been doing, but I know Canada has been opening up, um, yeah. travel to other parts of the country have opened up. And there are, it's it's nice to see other, other countries, places that, uh, for example, Cozumel, they care about their reefs. They, they actually yeah. had closed down part of theirs just to give it a chance to, 
you know, recover from, you know, the tourists, you know, showing up um, with all their sunscreen and whatever. Um, so, you know, even that's just a simple thing right there that people can do is um, look at the products that you're using um, for before you go into the water. I mean, I, my hair stands up on its own, so I don't have to worry about product, but um, <laughs> so it's just simple things. <laughs> Lucky you. you. Oh, oh yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, so we're, we're crying crocodile tears for you. <laughs> Hair yeah. problems. Yeah. <laughs> um, so anyways, uh, I really appreciate you guys doing this. Um, this is great having you guys on. Um, and I've been, you know, promoting you guys when I can, um, you know, just make people aware of this, you know, what's going on. Um, you know, and at DUI, we're, we're always about, you know, obviously diving. We want to get people out there diving because, um, you know, a lot of us at DUI are divers. We enjoy diving. We want to get out there and, and we don't want this stuff to disappear, right? Because it's part of our livelihood, but it's also part of what I love doing. You know, I get out there and dive three to four times a week in our cold, bad visibility water. Um, <laughs> Uh, but sometimes it's awesome. Um, I, I was in San Clemente Island um, last weekend, by the way, which is a, a military island. Uh, vis visibility is really good there. Um, and you find some interesting things sometimes out there that I have picked up, um, just kind of leftover things from obviously our military practicing. Um, but it makes a, you know, just this civilian going, wow, look, it's a 50 cal shell. <laughs> Yeah, you know, it's an interesting find every once in a while. So, just but I appreciate. Just don't use a hammer to like. You no, know. they're they're already spent. <laughs> <laughs> oh. um, someone was doing a little target practice, I think, from one okay. of the ships or boats. So, uh, so when you guys come out to San Diego or Southern California, big make sure that you hit us up, um, so and I will try and get as many of the different uh, dive clubs, dive shops, you know, involved with whatever you guys are, are going to be working on. So, so I appreciate it. I'd be um, awesome. And uh, anyways, if you have anything to say at the end here, I'm just going to, we're just going to wrap this up for the, for this month. Yeah. I just encourage everybody to, again, you know, go watch the film. We're really uh, proud of it. We'd love to get, uh, you know, it's everybody's chance to be a film critic, right? So let us know what you think. Um, you can send, I'm just Jim at force org is my, uh, my personal email, Gonzo is actually Steve at forceblueteam.org. Yeah. Let us know, watch the film, let us know what you think and, uh, and check out our website, but that, but that's it. But really thank you, Jack. I appreciate uh, the opportunity to, you know, we always want to tell our story. So thanks for giving us the platform. Yeah, that's yeah. great. Yeah, you're welcome. So, okay. So we have, um, I'm just going to do a quick closing here just to let people know that again, this is on Facebook Live. You can watch it instantly once we, or rewatch it once we um, end this session. Um, it'll be available on the YouTube channel, um, which we link to from all the different websites and social media stuff. So it's, it's viewable there, plus any of the past episodes. Um, and just to give you guys a, or everyone a, a quick heads up on what's next month is, is next month is um, we're going to have Rocio Bunker from um, San Diego. I know it's easy getting San Diego people to speak, um, <laughs> but she'll be talking about uh, the San Diego Film Festival um, and showing some of that stuff. So that'll be interesting. And just a and just a little quick sneak. Um, Bernie Chaudhary uh, of the Last Dive may be one of our hosts coming up in a few months. So if you haven't read that book. Um, definitely go and do that because it's an awesome book and that that will be fun too so so thanks everyone for coming out um we'll see you next month again it's on the first um thursday of each month at uh, 1 p.m pacific time so thanks for joining us thank you everybody and i have the information up right here um so you guys if or if anyone wants to get the screen capture of this here's the information where you can contact later on. Thanks.